All right, let's get started. First off, happy Thursday, and welcome to the series finale of CRISPR Office Hours. So we started this weekly webinar almost four months ago as a way to ensure the genome engineering community had a venue to ask questions, share their thoughts, so we could all navigate these challenging times together. We thought this would go on for a few weeks, but never did, our, did we in our dreams think that we'd be going strong for 16 episodes, over 2,300 people attending, and having 16 amazing panelists on. And all of this couldn't have been possible without the community and our amazing CRISPR Office Hour production team of Bobby Moon, Selena Rogers, and Diana Toe. Of course, this adventure wouldn't have been possible without my co-host, Kevin Holden, who has constantly encouraged brilliant scientists to share their thoughts, research, and take questions from the community. So from all of us here, I wanna take a moment to say thank you for joining us today and joining us over the past few months. And let's get started with CRISPR Office Hours as we're honored with our featured speaker for today. And quick note, housekeeping items. This episode and all of the previous CRISPR Office Hour episodes are on Synthigo's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Synthigo. And as always, we wanna make it as interactive as possible for the attendees and as engaging. So please go ahead and use the chat to send in your questions and we'll get to them as we can. Let's get started. My name is Aditya Vempati and I'm the VP of Marketing at Synthigo. And as always, I'm joined by my amazing host, Kevin Holden. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Dithya, and welcome everyone to CRISPR Office Hours. I'm your co-host, Kevin Holden, head of science at Synthigo. And once again, we're also joined today by our good friend and occasional guest, Jared carlson Stevermer, lead cell biologist at Synthigo. Hey, Jared. Hey, guys. Super happy to be here. Glad I get to keep my streak of alive of uh, appearing once per season around something like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, so the title for our episode, our final episode this summer is CRISPR Office Hours with Jennifer Delna. All right, so um, our modus operandi since we began CRISPR Office Hours during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, lockdown has been to keep calm and carry on. And our version of it here at Synthigo is to keep calm and CRISPR on. So please stick around until the end of today's episode and we'll tell you how to get a special edition keep calm and CRISPR on t-shirt sent to you. All right, so without uh, any further ado, let's meet today's panel. Um, Aditya, Jared, and I are very excited and honored to welcome CRISPR pioneer Jennifer Doudna to CRISPR Office Hours. Uh, Jennifer is a professor at University of California, Berkeley, and her lab was, of course, the first to describe the use of CRISPR gene editing technology, which I think we can all agree has really revolutionized all areas of biological research. So Jennifer is president and chair of the Innovative Genomics Institute and also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. So Jennifer, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And we're ha happy to have you here. Wonderful, well, hi everybody. And I, first of all, a huge thanks to Aditya, Kevin, uh, Jared, and the rest of the team at Synthigo. It's a, an honor to have the opportunity to talk to you today. And I think this idea of CRISPR office hours is, is a lot of fun, so um, thank you. So what I thought I would do today, I'd like to give a relatively short uh, formal presentation and leave lots of time for discussion. And um, I think there already is a very active chat going on, so that's great. And, and people can obviously type questions there. And I think we have some other questions that are keyed up for, uh, to kick us off at the end of the, the formal presentation. But uh, I'd like to, to just uh, start us off. And if I, who's, who's controlling the slides? I think it's you guys, right? Yeah, right here. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so thanks for the introduction, Jennifer. Real quick, as we get started, uh, there's usually a poll question that we do to get the audience engaged. All right, okay, yes, yes. No, no worries. And so we want to go back, and as we're wrapping things up, and ask folks, um, really, what cliche quarantine hobbies did you pick up? And obviously our options are Zoom hangouts, virtual workout classes, online shopping therapy. Uh, Bobby Moon goes by bleached hair and adopting pets, gardening, and uh, last one, starting weekly webinar series that gets, that you think is only going to last a month, but now you're on episode 16. So I wanna ask Jennifer, out of these, uh, which hobbies did you pick up during quarantine? Gardening and uh, 
natural. It's not exactly bleached hair. It's more like gray hair, but yeah, it, <laughs> it is COVID hair, that's for sure. COVID hair, I love it. <laughs> what about yourself, Kevin? Um, I mean, obviously, it's starting a weekly webinar series that um, we initially thought was only going to last um, a month, but now we're on episode 16. Um, outside of that, I have been doing a little gardening as well. So um, it's definitely one of those. And, I, you know, I'm guilty of a bunch of these except the bleach hair. I've definitely done some online shopping therapy. Nice. What about you, Jared? I'm going for the, uh, the natural bleach hair. My wife and I have been picking up a lot of hiking, a lot of biking, a lot of just trying to be outside and explore, explore around the uh, area. Nice. I, I definitely have to go with what Kevin said, starting the weekly webinar series, as well as virtual workout classes. We, we are, me and my fiance have definitely every day around 6, 6.30, turn on that Apple TV and uh, get a workout, virtual workout class in. So looks like a lot of folks here uh, have been doing online shopping therapy and, and gardening along with Zoom Hangouts. Nice. So we're going to go and end the poll. All right. So um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for running Aditya and thanks everyone for participating in the question. So Jennifer, actually, maybe just before you jump in and get started, um, um, we did actually uh, want to ask you, um, I think you, if you want to tee up your presentation here on the next slide, um, you can, um, you've, you've got listed here all of the institutes that you're affiliated with. And I thought maybe before we get started, maybe you can tell our audience a little bit about what makes these institutions such an amazing and special, all, and all amazing and special places to do science? Absolutely. The ones on the bottom there, Berkeley, the Innovative Genomics Institute, UCSF, HHMI, and Gladstone are all nonprofit organizations that uh, either support research as HHMI does or sponsor the kind of uh, academic environment that I think many of us find so exciting and wonderful to do creative work. And that's certainly the case for Gladstone, UCSF, and Berkeley. The Innovative Genomics Institute is a partnership of all three of those. And it's an institute we started a few years ago with the express purpose of bringing genome editing to uh, address problems facing humanity and doing it in a way that uh, takes into account affordability and accessibility. That's our fundamental mission. And I'm really excited to be working with my colleagues there. I'll say a little more about that at the end of the talk today. All right, oh, great. let me just say quickly, the NIH and NSF. Uh, so I think many people here, if you're in academia, you are familiar with the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. These are two um, taxpayer funded organizations at the federal national level here in the US that support academic research and boy we couldn't uh, we couldn't do our work without them so we are incredibly grateful to all the folks at NIH and NSF that support fundamental science. All right great thank you for sharing that um, so let's go ahead and get started um, uh, we'll let you uh, jump onto your uh, onto your outline here. Fantastic okay well like I said I will I will uh, keep this formal part relatively short hopefully um, but I, I really did want to just talk about three things today. I thought we could do a little uh, mini CRISPR 101 and, and uh, kind of the, the backdrop to where CRISPR came from, what it is naturally, and then how it's been harnessed for genome editing. And, uh, and then I wanna move at the end to talking about the um, uh, current pandemic and how CRISPR might become a powerful diagnostic tool that we can use to identify and, and diagnose the virus. So I'll say more about it, that at the end. So uh, diving in, so on the next slide, this is actually a, um, a cartoon that illustrates how CRISPR works in the environment. So we're looking at bacteria that might be growing in a biofilm, and here's a virus infecting that bacterium. If this bacterium has a CRISPR system, it can acquire a sequence of DNA from that infectious agent into a place in the genome called the CRISPR. And this is a place where these viral sequences are stored between repeat elements. It's a very distinctive kind of sequence that was identified by researchers originally. And that CRISPR sequence is transcribed into RNA that is then processed into units shown here that combine with a second type of RNA called tracer and a protein, the CRISPR-associated protein Cas9. 
And these RNAs then serve as the guides for Cas9. They allow it to interact with DNA sequences matching the 20 nucleotides in the guide RNA, opening up the DNA helix, allowing Cas9 to make a double-stranded break. And in bacterial cells, that cut to DNA triggers DNA degradation. So it actually evolved in bacteria not as a genome editing tool, but actually as a way to destroy viruses and plasmids and to do that in a programmed fashion. So how did I get into this? Well, uh, back in around uh, 2005 or so, I was a, a relatively new transplant to UC Berkeley. I had started my faculty career at Yale in 94, and then I got recruited out to the Bay Area where I began uh, studying RNA molecules that control gene expression in different systems. I've been an RNA researcher my whole career, but before that I was primarily focused on ribozymes and RNAs that have chemical activity, and we were um, interested in those molecular structures. And at Berkeley, I started expanding my interests into the, the biological functions of RNAs that regulate gene expression. And as part of that, I got introduced to CRISPR systems by Jillian Banfield, a colleague at Berkeley who was studying the way that bacteria defend themselves from, uh, from viruses. And, and one of the things that had come to her attention was this CRISPR system that I just showed to you. And so we began investigating the biochemistry of this. And if you go to the next slide, that eventually led to a collaboration with Emmanuel Charpentier's lab to study a particular type of CRISPR system that relied on this protein Cas9. And in work that we did together and published in 2012, Martin Yinek, a postdoc at the time in my lab at Berkeley, and Chris Chylinski, who was a graduate student with Emmanuel, worked together to figure out how Cas9 uses these two RNAs, CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, to interact with double-stranded DNA in a programmable fashion at this 20-letter uh, sequence that matches the sequence of the CRISPR RNA, resulting in a double-stranded break that's induced by the Cas9 protein itself. And this was a really a fun project. It was exciting to understand the fundamental mechanism of this CRISPR-based protein. But when we did this work, it also led to a uh, kind of a, a transformational discovery for us, which was that the system could actually be re-engineered as a single guided system. And I think the next slide might show that. Um, yeah, so this is work that uh, Martin Yinek had done in the lab where he showed that you could link together the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA into a format we called the single guide that would provide the target information on one end of the transcript and the structural handle for binding to Cas9 on the other end. And this was for us that one of that sort of, that sort of proverbial moment when what had begun as a basic science, very fundamental curiosity driven project morphed into a project that we realized was quickly going in a very interesting and new direction, namely providing a technology that could be used for something different than uh, what it's used for in nature, namely uh, genome editing. And to illustrate that, I wanted to show the video on the next slide. Oh yeah, please. Can I ask a quick question? So yes. we've all been using the sgRNAs for a long time now, right. and especially with Synthigo, you know, we've produced thousands and thousands and thousands of right. these. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, what was the actual inspiration that made you move from the tracer RNA into the sgRNA and how did you, you know, what led you to believe that that might actually still be might still be functional? Yeah, great question, Jared. So this is a, you know this is one of these experiments that really came about because of our thinking about the mechanism of this enzyme and the biochemistry we were doing in the lab uh, at Berkeley and together with Emmanuel, namely understanding how Cas9 uses an RNA guide to interact with DNA. So that was the purpose of the original set of experiments. And once we understood that it was actually a dual RNA guided system, it required both the CRISPR RNA and this separate tracer molecule, 
that led us to think, gee, you know, I wonder if those uh, RNAs, you know, what their purpose is in, in, the, in the protein. We didn't have any structural data at the time. We didn't have any crystal structures um, or EM structures that we now have. So we were kind of trying to imagine what that might look like. And, um, you know, Martin Yinek is a wonderful structural biologist in addition to a biochemist. And so his question was, gee, I wonder if we could simplify the system relative to what nature has done. And we asked the question initially to figure out, are the two ends of these RNA molecules close together in space? If they were, we reasoned that you might be able to physically, chemically look, link them together as shown here. And that was the original thinking with the experiment. But honestly, the other uh, thought we had was we understood by then that it was a dual RNA guided programmable enzyme. We thought, wouldn't it be great if it was a two component system, one protein and one RNA, and that's all you would need to program it to cut any desired DNA sequence. So when he did this experiment, which I like to say is, you know, in a way, one of the, one of the simplest experiments you can imagine, right? It's like, you know, just doing a restriction enzyme uh, type reaction, but doing it with this single guide construct. And we saw the result, namely that he could cut DNA at any desired place by using a single guide that was programmed with the appropriate sequence. You know, we literally looked at each other in the lab and said, holy smokes, you know, this is, a, this is gonna be a really an interesting and exciting tool because it would be very simple to express a single guide in cells and use it to program Cas9. And that's really the kind of the backstory to how we thought about this in those early days. Yeah, absolutely, so it's always those, those simple experiments that are the best. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so I think you've got a pretty incredible animation that shows us what exactly takes place uh, during the CRISPR editing of a cell. Uh, do you want to walk us through it? Yeah, let's take a look. So this is zooming into uh, a eukaryotic cell now. So the DNA is in the nucleus. And by putting a nuclear localization signal on Cas9, this protein will go into the nucleus with its guide RNA and literally search through all of the chromatin in there to find a sequence that matches the sequence of the guide. And this animation illustrates what we understand structurally about how that works. So the DNA literally melts apart. The RNA winds around one strand to form an RNA-DNA hybrid in the protein. And then the the protein cuts the DNA. We now have a double-stranded DNA break that's been introduced at a precise position. And Cas9 will hand that off to repair enzymes in the cell to fix that break by introducing a small change in the sequence, like shown here, or by introducing a whole new sequence of DNA if there's a template around in the cell to incorporate during the repair process. Now that idea, by the way, for genome editing with a, you know, by inducing a double-stranded break actually goes all the way back to um, my graduate advisor, Jack Shostak, who was the first person to publish the double-strand break repair model for DNA and yeast back in those days in the, in the 1980s. And then worked by people like Maria Jason, who recognized that if you could introduce a double-stranded break in mammalian cells, you could actually trigger DNA repair like this that would lead to a targeted you know, change to the DNA sequence in a genome. And, and, if, and I think many people in the audience here know that you know, CRISPR isn't the first or second or third uh, technology for doing this. It's uh, somewhere down the, farther down the queue there because uh, earlier there were mechanisms for using chemically modified nucleotides to cut DNA in cells, also using various kinds of engineered proteins like talons and zinc finger nucleases that are very famous for their genome editing activities. What made CRISPR unique though is that it was simple, right? It was just very simple. Nature had come up with this RNA programmable protein that once understood could be harnessed for the purpose of introducing double-stranded breaks to trigger genome edits like you just saw. And I think that's what has made it such a powerful technology is that it's been easily adopted by people around the world for lots of interesting fundamental science, but also increasingly for, for very applied kinds of, of problems. So if we go to the next slide, I yeah, just have- 
I was just going to say, Jennifer, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Yeah, um, and I just want to say Echo. So a few people put into the chat, what a cool movie. And that's such a great, uh, great little animation. But um, I know at least for myself too, when I, when I first read your paper in 2012, um, I was working in a synthetic biology group and um, I read this and I was actually doing a lot of method development, uh, trying to basically take different methods or come up with new ones for, um, for doing genome engineering um, and perturbing genomes and at scale. Um, and I just saw this and I was like, oh my God, this is like, there's so many different applications that you, I could use this for, but you, obviously there's a lot more, you, which you can talk about here. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's what's been so fun about the field, uh, Kevin, honestly, is that I think that for, for uh, really lit almost anybody who thinks about this technology and comes to understand it, they don't even have to understand the details of how it works. But if you know that you have a way to induce cells to make a change to their genetic code at a particular place, you can alter a gene in a precise fashion immediately the wheels start turning, you know, and you can think about all kinds of things that would be interesting to do with a tool like that. And that's exactly what's happened over the last eight years. So, you know, we've seen applications, of course, across the spectrum of, of biological research that are very interesting. And then lots of more applied um, uh, uses of genome editing, including applications in healthcare, agriculture, therapeutics, and diagnostics. So it's a, it's a really cross-cutting uh, kind of technology and tool that has, has, has really transformed in many ways, you know, the way that we now do biological research and think about ways to manipulate genomes. And by the way, this sort of came at a time when there was also an explosion of other technology advances, including DNA sequencing, genome sequencing was becoming easier and easier to do and, and cheaper, as well as really advanced computational tools for understanding genetics in ways that, you know, were very hard to do before. So you put those things together and it's an extraordinary time, I think, to be a biologist and to be working on biological systems because for all of you that are, are watching this and are, uh, you know, up and coming researchers, if you're, you know, a student uh, in training or, or a, a newly minted, uh, postdoc or faculty member or scientist at a company, you know that there are just so many things that you can now do uh, given uh, this uh, toolkit that we have. So I thought in the last a couple of slides I would uh, here, I just want to mention things that I think are, are really exciting that are coming down the line. And uh, if you go to the next slide, so this is really just a, you know, meant to illustrate um, a, a principle here, which is that with a toolkit like this, and then with CRISPR-based gene editing in particular, we now have ways to correct disease-causing mutations that, you know, in uh, just a few years ago, this would have been basically science fiction, you know, but the idea that you could actually correct a mutation like this one, a well-known, well-understood mutation that causes sickle cell disease in patients that have this single base pair mutation in the human uh, beta globin gene, is extraordinary to think that we now have the means to do this. And, and you may know that if you follow the, the popular media about this, you know that a company called CRISPR Therapeutics, which was started by Emmanuel Charpentier, has actually announced recently that uh, they have, have effectively cured a patient, Victoria Gray, of her sickle cell disease by using CRISPR in a fashion that turns on a form of hemoglobin called fetoglobin that can override the sickle cell gene in this case and basically return her blood cells to, to normal. So this is a, an amazing opportunity. I think many of us feel very excited that we're on the verge of essentially a new era of therapeutics where a cure for a gene, a genetic disease like this can be available to patients. And what I think about now most of the time is, you know, when I'm not thinking about COVID is um, I'm thinking about how to take that fundamental capability and make it accessible and affordable to people, right? I don't want to see this be available only to those that can afford a $2 million treatment. I want to figure out how we turn it into a, eventually a, a standard of care for people that have this type of affliction. 
Yeah, Jennifer, so, I, I, yeah. I do want to ask you actually too, because um, um, you, you listed all of those um, different applications, um, therapeutics, agriculture, but when we think about it beyond just uh, having obviously a molecular um, biology application, and here you're talking about curing a disease, we're actually talking about a technology that transformatively can actually change the world we live in and the lives of people. So I, I think it's really important to, to, to really underscore that um, as well. Absolutely. And again, I can't, I can't say enough that I think this is really, a, it's the future for all of you that are part of this presentation today, because it's all of you that are going to take tools like this and uh, do creative, inventive, and important work with it. And, and I just, you know, I can't tell you how excited I am for the future and how really honored I am to be, to be part of all of this. It's just been an extraordinary experience to be, to be part of this and to work with such amazing people in doing it. Uh, for me, science is always, you know, goes hand in hand. It's, uh, you know, it's ideas, but it's, but it's people. And, and I, I, that's, what I, that's what I love about uh, being a researcher. So, 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 so yeah, so go ahead. I mean to interrupt you again, but um, uh, speaking of the future though, um, I, I know that, you know, your lab has put out, you know, all this fantastic work describing the, the original uh, uh, strepogenes, Cas9, but also new nucleases and really diving deep into the biochemistry around how they function. And I, so I, I didn't want to steal any thunder, but I know recently, um, if you can talk about it, despite a pandemic going on, your lab actually published some pretty exciting work with Jill Banfield um, around a uh, you know, really novel uh, CRISPR nuclease. Is that, you're going to tell us about this? Well, uh... <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I think it's on my next slide. Uh, let, let's, let's take a look. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, thank you, Kevin, for that. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> King, King that up. Uh, you might, you might have, you might have known that was coming, but, uh, basically what Kevin is, is pointing out is that in the, in the eight years since that original work that we published with Emmanuel's lab, we've continued to investigate the fundamental mechanisms of these CRISPR-Cas proteins, as well as looking for what else is out there. And as you might imagine, you know, the deeper you look in the microbial universe, the, the more of these things you find. And most recently, this is work that we published uh, recently with, uh, in collaboration with Jill Banfield's lab at Berkeley, is the finding that there are some very big phage running around infecting uh, bacteria in the environment, and those big phage carry around their own CRISPR system. Who knew? And the cool thing about these is that they're very compact. So they have just one gene called that we call Cas5, as well as a CRISPR array. So they are an active, it certainly looks like an active CRISPR system, but it's got just this one protein component. And that protein component turns out to be just like we found originally for Cas9, an RNA-guided double-stranded DNA cutting enzyme that can generate double-stranded breaks, uh, but do so with a lot less uh, you know, widgets and stuff hanging on the protein because it's only about half the size of the Cas9 protein. And so that's kind of a you know, cool uh, observation about bacteria and their phage. And we're trying to actively you know, figure out how these are working in phage. But we're also interested in this as a technology because these proteins are potentially going to be easier to deliver into cells. Phage have clearly figured that out. And we now have a number of additional collaborations running uh, the gamut from looking at the microbiology of this to also figuring out how to package this into delivery vehicles that will be useful for gene editing in human and plant cells. So uh, that's that's sort of you know a little uh, taste of of some of the, the work that's going on actively in my academic lab at Berkeley. Yes. And uh, in the last minute yes, here, just, sorry, yeah. Just, Sorry to interrupt you again. Um, I had a couple of questions about this. I think Jared wanted to ask you something too. Oh, but sure. yes. um, I, just from this from this part though on the phage, um, my training's in microbiology, so I'm super interested in this. Is is this? Do you, do you believe this is a system, uh, an occurrence where a phage has this, these biggie phages, so to speak, have just basically kind of accidentally picked up um, these genes from the bacteria and then packaged them and then gone on and it's given them a selective advantage? Is that what's happened here? That's my guess. Um, one of the things that's puzzling about these proteins is that they look 
like they are probably um, convert, you know, examples of convergent evolution. They're quite different from other Cas proteins. We don't know that for sure, and it's hard, you know, there certainly is a, a connection to other proteins in this kind of what's called the Cas12 superfamily of Cas enzymes. But um, where they originated from, and you know, I, I think your your hypothesis is probably right that they got picked up at some point by a phage and they're useful in either uh, helping phage fight off other phage or we actually actually also have some evidence that they're involved in um, perhaps some kind of gene regulation in their hosts that's something that's still being investigated but i think is a very interesting possibility with these phage cas enzymes so Jennifer, you were talking a lot about building up these collaborations and you've obviously been working with Jill Banfield for a long time. <laughs> uh, it seems like your names always go side by side, but with this whole, uh, you know, with COVID, it seems like we're getting a lot more collaborations, a lot more cross-discipline talking to people. Um, for example, we've been taking part with some of, uh, with the QCRG and UCSF, um, and we've talked about that work on previous uh, office hours, if anybody wants to take a look at that on our YouTube page. Um, but when we, were when we were presenting at one of their symposia, we saw that Melanie Ott at the Gladstone um, was working on some CRISPR-based COVID diagnostic tools um, that I believe you guys are trying to co-develop together. Uh, could you give us a little bit of insight into that? Absolutely, and that tees up my next slide. Thank you, uh, Jared. Uh, so um, what I wanted to just point out here is that one of the fascinating things about studying these CRISPR-Cas proteins and how they work is that every now and then you uncover something unexpected. And that was certainly the case here. So this is work that we published originally in 2016. It was the work of a former graduate student, Alexandra East Seletsky. And, and this came about from studying a class of proteins that are called Cas13 that target RNA naturally. Instead of DNA, they actually go after RNA sequences and chop them up. And in the course of studying that enzymatic activity of Cas13, which was also uh, reported originally by the collaboration between Kunin and, and Feng Zhang, um, what Alex, Alexandra noticed and, and realized was that you could actually use that uh, these proteins in an interesting way for diagnostics by using the activity that's in this cartoon. And this is because for Cas13, when this protein, which is RNA guided, interacts with an RNA target sequence shown in that uh, cartoon with base pairing, what happens is that um, the protein turns on its RNA cutting activity but it's not, so, not uh, uh, restricted to the sequence of RNA that it's actually bound to. It actually can cut other RNA molecules that are maybe provided in, in, the, in the mix, uh, either in the cell or by, a, by an experimenter. And so if you hook those RNA molecules up to fluorophores, then you can actually use this for detection because when the fluorophore labeled RNA gets cut, and that only happens when this protein interacts with its target sequence, you release a uh, detectable signal. And so this was published in that 2016 paper, and we proposed this as a way to use these CRISPR enzymes as diagnostics. And then later, Janice Chen, another uh, graduate student in the lab, found out that the same thing turned out to be true for Cas12 proteins. And this was also very unexpected. These are RNA-guided DNA cutting enzymes, but they also have this ability to cut um, uh, fluorophore labeled molecules, but in that case, uh, single-stranded DNAs. And they do that again only after interacting with a target sequence. So you can use this fluorophore release as a, as a signal that the enzyme has found its target. And so along comes coronavirus and, uh, and suddenly, um, you know, this, this uh, idea which had been uh, under development by uh, various academic groups and two startup biotech companies, one called Sherlock and the other called Mammoth, suddenly there was a very immediate urgent need for, for a detection mechanism like this. And so that's now become uh, something that, uh, you know, has really accelerated the pace of, of this research. And, 
And uh, we're now at a point where these companies and various academic labs, including, as you said, Melanie Ott, whose team at the Gladstone is leading a multiple academic lab uh, effort to develop this as a point of care way of testing for coronavirus and eventually other viruses too. Because the cool thing about CRISPR, as everybody knows now, is that um, this is, these are programmable proteins. So you can program it to look for coronavirus, but you could in principle program it to look for influenza or HIV or something else. So um, I'm very excited about the potential for this and happy to discuss it more. Um, and maybe we'll just wrap up. I just have a couple more slides and then I really definitely want to open it up to questions. Yeah, so, one more question I had there, which I think okay. relates to what's been going on is, a lot of us have heard about the lack of testing availability with COVID-19. Yeah. And, and you've decided to spearhead a movement at the IGI that has been incredibly impactful. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Right, so um, yeah, so thanks, thanks for that, Aditya. So you're exactly right. So at the IGI, back in, in March, we got together and this was right before California, you know, really kind of went into shutdown. And we sat in a room uh, and we were not socially distanced at the time, but this was before, before that. But, uh, but we asked ourselves, you know, what can we do as scientists to address this urgent global health need in public health? And the first thing that came to everybody's mind was testing, right? It was clear that we needed to do testing. And so the folks that you see here, Abby Stahl, Connor Sushita, Enrique Lenshaw, and Jennifer Hamilton, these four uh, members of my academic lab decided to join with collaborators shown on the bottom of the slide, including several companies, to create a clinical testing laboratory at IGI. And so basically what we did within three weeks, it was extraordinary, people working kind of 24 seven around the clock, we were able to get our university, had to go all the way up to the level of the University of California Office of the President. So Janet Napolitano had to approve this, but we were able to get a clinical lab approved at Berkeley to allow us to accept uh, patient samples and test for coronavirus using the polymerase chain reaction. So not, not CRISPR here, but you know, using PCR. However, having that uh, clinical lab running now for several months has allowed us to do things that would be very hard to do in a traditional commercial clinical laboratory like LabCorp or Quest, because of course we're embedded at a research university. So we have extraordinary scientists around like the four that you see here, but many others as well. And so these folks have continued to not only run a routine clinical test for coronavirus, we've now run several tens of thousands of tests and we work with a number of partners in the community. We raised uh, philanthropic support to be able to work with uh, groups that provide health care to the uninsured, to the unsheltered, uh, people that are uh, just released from prison, uh, people in uh, nursing homes. So these are people that are desperately in need of testing and follow up for their to monitor their health. So we're really, really honored to be working with them and helping them providing testing that they would otherwise not have available. And then of course, we're also now very actively working to open up the Berkeley campus and make sure that it remains a safe environment as undergraduate students arrive back on the campus in the fall. And I've been doing a lot of work on that over the summer with the team. In the future, we, we're now running a, a saliva test in addition to a traditional kind of nasal swab based test. And we're also very, very excited to be partnering with companies and the Melaniot led academic groups that are developing CRISPR because we think that we're gonna be able to use our clinical laboratory and the samples that we have there to validate that test. And ultimately we hope provide it as a point of care alternative to people for very rapid turnaround detection of coronavirus. And uh, I think that's really my last slide. I just wanted to, yes, point out, you know, say a huge shout out and thank you to all of my colleagues at the Innovative Genomics Institute and its three uh, partner institutes, uh, institutions, UCSF, Berkeley, and Gladstone. And, um, and then, of course, uh, acknowledging various um, commercial connections that I have there on the bottom, including at Synthago. So thank you, uh, Synthago, for, for everything that you're doing in the, in the pandemic. I think you guys have also been amazing stepping up your efforts. And I know you provide uh, guide RNAs and, and cell lines and other things to laboratories now around the world. And we're, we're all very grateful for what you do as well.
and I'll stop there and hopefully we can open up for more, more chat and questions. Yeah, great, uh, Jennifer. I did just also want to ask you real quick, um, uh, the Cold Spring Harbor, the, every year they do the genome engineering meeting. And um, actually, this is where you and I first met four years ago uh, in 2016. Um, and um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about how um, it's, it's changing this year because of COVID. Thanks, Kevin. Yes. Yeah, so this is a meeting that, uh, as, you, as you just indicated, has been running now for several years at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And it's been a very popular meeting. It's one of their biggest meetings that they have. And uh, lots of people that come there to hear about the latest and greatest um, science that's happening, both fundamental science, but also what's happening uh, more in, on the more applied end of genome editing, as well as thinking about the big picture, ethical questions, uh, societal challenges that have come up because of this very powerful technology. So anyway, uh, it's, it's been a great forum for all of those things. This year, uh, as an organizer, uh, we, we, I'm one of the organizers for this, we had to ask ourselves, uh, how do we hold this meeting safely? And we concluded a couple of months ago that we had to do it virtually. So we're honored to be able to provide the science, the outstanding science that people have come to expect for this meeting in a virtual format. We encourage everyone to, to, uh, that wants to attend to, to do so. And it's gonna be for the, the days shown here, 19, 20, 21. And um, we will have some really interesting things there in addition to the, the outstanding science that you, have, you will, uh, you will, you will uh, undoubtedly enjoy from that meeting. We also have a, uh, we have a, a couple of panels uh, discussions. We're gonna, going to have a very special seminar to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of uh, Rosalind Franklin which will be outstanding, just I'm sure very, very interesting. And we have Walter Isaacson, who's a quite a well-known journalist who will be uh, chairing a panel discussion about uh, what's happening right now with coronavirus and uh, CRISPR and sort of the, some of the bigger picture things that are happening in science that have really changed with the pandemic. And I think it's a, that should also be a very interesting discussion. So anyhow, encourage everybody to attend. It's not a free meeting. I don't know what the actual uh, cost is, but um, you can go to the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory website and uh, check that out. Yeah, great. And I think um, we just put the link in the, in the chat down there. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, Dithya, do you wanna take over from this part? Yeah. So we have a few questions uh, from the audience. And as always, we've been privileged enough to get high in our interaction and great uh, panelists and scientists from previous office hours also. And with that, we actually have two questions uh, coming in from scientists who were on office hours uh, previous seasons. So the first one is from Laura Lambert. And her question is, what advice do you have specifically for female junior faculty as they establish their careers? Great question, Laura. I guess what I would say is my, my advice, my, my first um, uh, piece of advice is, is really to go for it. And what I mean by that is, is to, to go after your, your biggest, most exciting ideas and don't let anybody tell you that you, that you can't do it. I, if I had a if I had a nickel for every time in my career, somebody has told me, well, that experiment won't work or that's a silly idea or something, um, I could probably uh, fund, <laughs> I could fund something. I could buy a few Synthigo guide RNAs anyway. Um, uh, but you know, I think the point is, and this is really advice to, to, to everybody, not just, just female scientists, but to anybody who's starting out is to you know, trust, your, trust your, your judgment and your passion if you're excited about an idea, there's probably something to it and don't let anybody derail you because I've found that, uh, you know, not every idea pans out, but you have to, you have to take risks to, um, you know, to, 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 to do interesting work. And, and I think you should be uh, um, embracing those risks and, and, you know, don't let anybody uh, derail you from that. Absolutely, that's, that's a wonderful answer. Um, we've also gotten a question from former panelist Imran House um, and, you know, on the, uh, in the other hemisphere, but in your opinion, what is the next breakthrough bi biologist should be focused on for enhancing disease treatments? I know we've been at a breakneck pace with CRISPR, whether it's be base editing or all the you know, epigenetic editing that people have done with. Uh, do you think it's something like that or is there something else that's out there on the horizon? 
Well, uh, thanks for that question, Imran. And I guess I would, I would, I give, I would give sort of a, a, a two-pronged answer to that. I would say certainly it's, uh, you know, continuing to advance uh, genome editing technologies, I think will be, you know, you know, there, there are more breakthroughs there for sure. I mean, I, for I, just an example of that is that, you know, I think the ability to insert very large pieces of DNA would be tremendously enabling. And for those of you that are using CRISPR, you know that that's still kind of on the bleeding edge of the technology. So I think that's an area where there's room for, you know, breakthrough science and discoveries and, and, and engineering that will be transformative. And the other, the other thing, in, certainly in this field, that I think will be incredibly enabling is delivery, you know, figuring out how to get genome editing molecules into cells and tissues in an organism, especially in the human body or in plants. I think, you know, though there, there are just tremendous opportunities once that uh, challenge is, is really figured out. Um, yeah, we had a couple of other questions that were submitted through through the chat. Um, and maybe this one kind of leads on from what you were just talking about. Uh, Paige Whitehead, who says she is the founder of uh, Nyoka Design Labs, asks, what do you think um, the most powerful biotechnology applications are to ensure humanity is able to live sustainably on our planet for centuries to come? Oh, that's a, that's a, wow. That's a, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I have a great answer uh, for you. It's a really important question. I guess, you know, when I think about, I guess what that question is making me think about is, um, is the challenge of climate change really? Because I think that to me, that is really the biggest uh, challenge that I think humanity faces together, you know, in, going in the future, especially thinking, you know, many years in the future. And so how do we address that? And at the Innovative Genomics Institute, our, our thinking there is that we really need to be, it has to be a kind of a two-pronged approach from a science perspective. We need to be working on agriculture to you know, uh, create plants that are gonna be resistant to drought, resistant to pests and things like that that are gonna be increasingly problematic with climate change. And the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is thinking about the microbial world and how do we manipulate microbes um, I'm doing some work right now with Jill Banfield's lab that I'm very excited about that actually uses CRISPR to edit microbes, not individually in the laboratory, as many people are already doing, but to do it in their natural context of a, a, a complex population of microbes. And imagine that that, you know, if that technology really becomes, uh, you know, possible to utilize in different microbial systems, then you could imagine manipulating microbes in ways that will be also incredibly important for agriculture, but also for um, you know other environmental applications, and, and the human microbiome is a, you know an important uh, application of that as well. So I think that to me that's uh, that's where I would be focusing honestly is, is thinking about how we how we address the challenges of climate change productively. Great. So um, I know we had a lot of other questions that were submitted. Um, we can't get to all of them today, um, but. Uh, maybe if it's okay, Jennifer, if we can pass some of them on to you, and if you if you have uh, time, I know you're very busy. Maybe you can um, uh, we can we can send you some. You can we can get back to the the other people that, um, who are joining us on the chat here today. Happy to, yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, I think um, we did have a couple of things we wanted to touch on today. If you can move forward, please, Aditya. Um, and so the first one is um, we're actually really uh, proud and happy to announce that we're going to be. Um, organizing a virtual scientific symposia um, ourselves that we're calling World CRISPR Day um, that will be in October. And really we're putting this uh, together as a way to get some of the leading researchers and pioneers in CRISPR to discuss the latest trends in research um, for a wide range of genome engineering applications. Um, so we'll be announcing in, in the next couple of weeks some specific speakers and schedules um, and really um, uh, hope it's a way that everyone can work collaboratively together uh, during this time. Um, it will be virtual, but we did also want to announce, um, now we have Jennifer here with us, that Jennifer actually will be our keynote speaker um, at World CRISPR Day, so we're very excited uh, for that. So we hope you can all join us uh, for that event. Okay. All right. So with that, um, I want to take a moment to say thank you to the entire production crew. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible every week without them. They are the uh, MVPs that you don't see. They are the folks that make this 
entire weekly show run without a hitch. Make sure the recordings are on YouTube and support the community in every way possible. Uh, shout out to Bobby Moon, who's our Director of Growth Marketing, Selena Rogers, who's our Marketing Event Specialist, and Diana Toe, who's our Associate Director of Brand Design. Everything you see here, all the outputs are their efforts and their collaboration and their hard work and uh, teamwork together. So thank you. Yeah, and um, we'd also just like to give a massive thank you to um, uh, all of the workers at Synthago, particularly um, the people that have been staying and working on site during the pandemic um, for both our manufacturing and production facilities. Um, it's extremely important. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, we've been providing um, RNA molecules for people doing COVID-19 testing. Uh, we've been engineering cell lines um, as part of um, a, a COVID uh, um, interactome studies and uh, in, in search of disease therapeutics for COVID. And also importantly, um, you know, all of the other research that the world is normally doing for cancer research, disease research, whatever have you, um, all that needs to keep happening as well. So, you know, we have facilities where we're able to um, keep those, um, uh, a lot of projects running for a lot of scientists um, uh, because we can do some of the work um, with, with a little more automation. So um, thank you all to the, to the Synthago employees um, for uh, joining us today, if you were able to, and also for, um, for making Synthago uh, to keep, basically keep running uh, during this really challenging time. Absolutely. I just want to double down real quick on what Kevin said as well about, you know, our R&D lab is completely pivoted to trying to enable a bunch of SARS-CoV-2 research and without, you know, without our factory, without all of our production staff, um, none of that would have been possible. Working through a pandemic hasn't been, hasn't been easy for anybody. So massive shout out to them. Um, so with that, it's my, my fortune to be able to say, if you want to get your very own Keep Calm and CRISPR on shirt, we've been wearing them around the labs way too much. We see probably at least one a day. And so if you want to get your own limited edition one, please go ahead and visit the URL, synthago.com slash calm. Um, I think we've been informed that they have been shipping out to people. So get yours before they're gone. And we'll, we'll make sure uh, we'll ship one out to you, Jennifer, and uh, get some to your lab as well. So um, I will wear it with pride. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. So um, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate um, you taking the time to come on and, and speak to our audience um, and also to us here on CRISPR Office Hours. And thank you uh, very much, everyone, for, for making the show a success this summer. And please, everyone, stay safe and keep calm and CRISPR on.